Okay, um, thank you for the introduction and uh, for inviting me here today. And so, uh, uh, Dr. Shea was going to give uh, some uh, uh, information and background on cancer genetics, and I'm not here to speak about cancer genetics, but I'll be here to speak about cancer metabolomics, and I'll make the argument and try to show how this omics level can interface with other omics levels, including genomics, to give us sort of a, a systems uh, medicine, a systems biology understanding of a particular pathologic process, such as uh, cancer. So in the case of uh, metabolomics, what I show on the first slide is uh, what has been sort of sorted out over the last uh, century or so. Uh, some of the small molecules that we all know uh, from our textbooks, and they can be sort of uh, segregated into several general areas, which I've uh, uh, shown here. And, uh, and so the, the uh, focus of metabolomics is to sort of look at this in a holistic way, the same way that somebody studying RNA expression would look at transcriptomics. Okay, so what I'd like to do today, since uh, metabolomics is really a field that's taken off in the last um, uh, eight to ten years, is I'd like to make some introductory comments about the field for some of you who may not be as familiar with it, and uh, also talk about the, uh, the um, uh, computational uh, constraints and demands on this, in this area, which are still uh, in the process of being worked out. Uh, then I'll uh, speak a bit about uh, uh, cancer biology and the application of metabolomics uh, in that area. We know that cancer has uh, some fundamental alterations in metabolism, such as the Warburg effect. And uh, then the idea, and what I wanted to focus on today, is developing an approach where one can look at biofluids, such as urine and serum, and, uh, perhaps breath metabolomics. Uh, well, the cable just fell. I hope that's not a disaster. And uh, uh, cancer metabolomics. And uh, to uh, look at particular biomarkers, which we can start developing with the idea of uh, assessing uh, both uh, the diagnosis and prognosis and uh, response to therapy. Uh, I'll show an example that's from our group in collaboration with Anton Welsting's group at Georgetown. Uh, with a particular mouse model for pancreatic cancer. I'll then uh, uh, present some uh, uh, pilot studies uh, from one pancreatic cancer patient survey that's been carried out by Amrita Chima, who is the co-director of our metabolomics facility with, uh, with me. And then I'll uh, try to uh, pull this together in the integration of metabolomics into a systems medicine approach uh, using our uh, sort of GI cancer focus here at Georgetown and uh, Suba Matahavian, who's uh, running that. Okay, uh, so in the case of metabolomics, uh, it really uh, um, uh, completes the spectrum going all the way from DNA to small molecules. And uh, I've just listed the, uh, the, uh, the, the complexity here on the uh, right. Uh, we now know there's about 20,000 genes, maybe 100,000 transcripts with alternate splicing, uh, probably comparable or maybe somewhat larger number of proteins, but then when you start talking about post-translational modifications, I went to one uh, uh, a talk from somebody from PNL, a uh, session that I chaired recently, and he made an estimate that could be up to 40 trillion different uh, protein combinations if you can compare all these uh, 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 modifications. Um, in the case of uh, metabolomics, there's about 2,500 sort of classic metabolites that you see in mammalian uh, physiology. Uh, that's really just a small number of uh, the actual number, probably uh, uh, at least tenfold that number. And then, of course, if we start talking about uh, uh, xenobiotics, uh, gut microbiome, uh, dietary components, uh, 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 environmental toxicants, uh, we're up in the hundreds of thousands of molecules. Plant metabolites, are, uh, plant metabol uh, the, the metabolome is much more complex. There's approximately 125,000 known uh, plant metabolites at this point in time. So the next question is, why bother with metabolites and metabolomics? Well, uh, if you want to sort of argue the case, 
they're downstream of the genome and uh, proteome and more close, closer to the phenotype. Uh, uh, very subtle changes in RNA or protein levels can have big changes in metabolism. Uh, uh, again, we can sort of argue that the, the genes and the proteins are just uh, predictive of what is happening at the, uh, at the uh, uh, um, physiologic level, and so metabolomics provides a snapshot of that. Okay, uh, in the case of the metabolome, as I said, there's a, a vast number of uncharacterized metabolites, and uh, the, the type of approaches we use, uh, which is primarily mass spectrometry, allows us to assess these even when we don't know exactly what they are. Okay, so what is new in the field, and why has this field sort of taken off, and why have I sort of moved uh, some of our efforts from uh, uh, our uh, 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 genomic and like the biology approaches to metabolomics. Well, uh, as far as just giving an overview of the methods, you first have to separate the metabolites by gas and liquid chromatography typically. The LC approach has some advantages, and uh, typically one can assess a, a, a larger number of metabolites. Uh, the big change in the, in the uh, technology has been the um, uh, the detection, uh, 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 Jeremy Nicholson at Imperial, who really is the, the father of this uh, field, uh, originally uh, used an NMR approach, uh, which is powerful but less sensitive than uh, uh, mass spectrometry. So these time of flight mass specs started coming online, and I've listed here the number of publications uh, where uh, it, metabolomics or metabolomics is mentioned. And these machines started to come online about 2005, 2006. As you can see, there's just been an explosion, almost an exponential increase in the number of PubMed publications uh, each year since then. So there's now over 6,000 publications in the literature. So uh, why are these machines important? I've given some uh, uh, reasons. It's high resolution. You have high sensitivity. Uh, you get exact mass determination. But most importantly, I think, is that it's higher resolution than the original NMR. Uh, typically, 50 to 100 metabolites can be seen by NMR. Whereas with uh, uh, the modern QTOF approach, uh, 5 to 20,000 peaks in a particular experiment is typical. Also, it is a sort of dilute and shoot, particularly for biofluids. You crash out the proteins and you can run, uh, uh, we've run up to 1,500 samples at a time. Uh, and finally, um, and this was supposed to appear, and, then, and now I guess it will appear. Uh, we uh, have been designated Water Center of Innovation and Metabolomics at Georgetown, so we're the first in the U.S. Uh, Frank Gonzalez at NCI and several others also have centers now. And uh, from a funding standpoint, uh, this has been uh, beneficial for many of the uh, faculty at Georgetown. Over 40 are using the facility actively. Um, we have over 20 outside users. We're now part of the mid Atlantic Consortium, where we're providing the metabolomic support for universities all the way from Hopkins and, uh, down south to the University of Virginia. And for those of you who know about the NIH grant system, there's a variety of uh, grants that uh, our uh, metabolomics is providing an important component. So uh, these are the types of machines we use, and so we're a water shop, and we're using uh, the water's machines primarily. And uh, what we get here is a, a, a continuous spectrum. So uh, with, with time here, uh, you, the peaks will be coming out with time, and you can um, uh, measure uh, the uh, particular mass and the intensity, or you can plot it versus uh, uh, mass and, uh, and, and, and elution time from the, uh, uh, from the uh, 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 chromatography, liquid chromatography uh, um, output, and uh, the, the take-home message is, is that we're getting this continuous uh, three-dimensional uh, type of plot uh, with time. Uh, a typical experiment can easily uh, generate a DVD size, uh, uh, three to uh, five gigabytes of data. Uh, the typical workflow is we get the, chroma the chromatogram, and let's say we're comparing normal versus malignant, uh, we uh, identify particular peaks that uh, uh, show difference uh, between, uh, let's say, control and uh, cancer. Uh, they, they are then put through a variety of statistical packages. Uh, when we've identified the ones that, were, uh, that we think are important, uh, we uh, will use uh, purified standards to uh, validate by MSMS and MRM quantification and the like. So there's a heavy uh, uh, analytic chemistry component to this. 
So uh, just to mention, uh, uh, before going into the cancer metabolomics, uh, what we have found doing this is that uh, the uh, computational challenges are, uh, are immense. And it's really sort of using American term, the Wild West, as far as how you want to analyze these the data. Uh, there have been a variety of groups making important contributions, such as Gary Schustek at the Scripps. And uh, some of the problems that we're faced with is, is that it's uh, uh, somewhat dissimilar uh, from some of the typical data sets, such as one sees with microarrays or sequencing. Uh, some of the problems are very high noise levels, uh, particularly with human populations. Uh, one thing that drives the uh, statistic people absolutely crazy is missing data because you're doing peak alignment. And uh, uh, so zero uh, filling is uh, problematic when you're trying to uh, assess uh, the, the, the importance. And uh, then, of course, biofluids, uh, there's issues about normalization and the like. And then finally, there's a staggering yield of, uh, of quantitative data that uh, is, uh, uh, requires to be uh, considered. So what we have done is we've put together a variety of different st statistical packages, which I won't go into here. Some of them are relatively simple, uh, such as this BAMP package, which allows sort of a, a graphic representation of any changes in particular metabolites. And we've developed others which were, are in the process of being published, uh, such as SPICA, which is a novel approach that doesn't measure the actual levels of a particular metabolite, but compares the uh, metabolite it compares metabolite pairs. So the advantage there is, is you actually technically uh, do not need a control sample, so you're doing internal normalization. Uh, the most important, uh, uh, I think, component from a day-to-day -day standpoint is this metabolizer package, uh, which Titus Mack and my group with Leo Laiaki and others in my group have put together. And so this is a comprehensive uh, package that uh, provides st uh, statistical support and then allows interfacing with some of the uh, uh, small molecule databases to identify, get putative identification of metabolites from the peaks, and then also go on to pathway analysis. So uh, the importance of metabolizer is, is that uh, many of the biologists trying to get into metabolomics, it's just a, a daunting problem, just trying to get, trying to get started. And um, uh, many of the packages are not particularly user friendly. So this package has been made to be user-friendly, uh, and uh, it, it, it's commonly used in my lab and others at Georgetown, uh, particularly for novices in the field, uh, those who are new to the field, but also for those who've been in it uh, for some time. So uh, some of the output is listed here. We can do uh, um, uh, PCA and MDS type plots for statistical significance, uh, heat maps, correlation analysis, uh, keg pathway integration, uh, and a variety of other sort of graphic displays of the data. And so um, uh, a particular workflow is here. Uh, there's an interesting uh, zero filling approach, uh, filtering approach rather than just as that zero filling approach, which uh, uh, was actually quite appealing to the reviewers who reviewed this for analytic chemistry recently. And so this paper is now in press and you should be able to get a copy soon and uh, download the software from our site and, and, and get working on it if you wish. Um, as far as uh, identifying particular metabolites, uh, this particular software package will uh, uh, access some of the major databases that are out there and give you putative identity and also give you pathway analyses before you go on to identify particular metabolites uh, specifically using both uh, well, using targeted approaches of various sorts. Okay, in the case of cancer, uh, we know the tumor suppressors and oncogenes affect metabolism. I just show a very simple schema here. Uh, for my friend P53, which my group has worked on for many years, uh, we know that this is a master transcription factor, in, uh, which is a tumor suppressor. And it controls a variety of uh, uh, genes that are involved in metabolism. I've shown several here, uh, such as uh, 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 Tiger, SCO2, and the like. So these genes are directly impacting metabolism. Uh, AM, uh, AM kinase is, uh, has, uh, feeds into P53. Uh, AKT uh, has a, a pro-growth and uh, um, uh, anabolic effects and is uh, also um, associated with uh, cancer signaling. And so when these genes are overexpressed, or in the case of B53 inactivated, 
you get a, a, a substantial change in the, in the metabolism of the cell, and some of this has been out in, in, by a variety of groups over the years. And just to show that we're not the only ones interested in cancer metabolomics, uh, here's another uh, plot of a number of PubMed publications that come out each year mentioning metabolomics and cancer together, and there's almost a thousand out there now. So this is an area of active investigation. Now, as uh, I mentioned, our laboratory's major focus and much of our support is on stress signaling and injury responses. So the idea here is that I was going to try to uh, 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 leverage Jerry's talk on uh, cancer uh, genomics uh, to show how we can expand on that with metabolomics. Okay, so what is our ultimate hope? Well, our ultimate goal is to be as good as a dog. And uh, uh, what I show here is a report from a Japanese group that trained a particular bomb-sniffing dog, to, uh, and they reported uh, that they uh, had up to 98% accuracy in predicting um, uh, 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 cancer in, uh, in uh, uh, early cancer detection uh, by having the dog uh, smell uh, people's breath. So the sensitivity of the dog uh, olfactory system is greater than uh, any of our instruments, but that's a goal that we're uh, shooting for. Okay, in the case of P53, I'll just mention briefly sort of the massive changes that we see. Um, uh, here, here's a PCA plot where we run a variety of, uh, of in, uh, independent isolates of uh, a cell line, uh, which is a P53 wild type line, TK6. And the proximity of the points is how similar the metabolomic spectrum is. And the TK6, you can see clusters. And in the subline that where the P53 has been knocked out by gene targeting, you can see the clear separation. Uh, you can also see this in wild type and P53 knockout mice. And what Leah Layaki in my lab has done, she's, we're showing here results with urine, is we've looked at uh, changes in metabolites with red going up and, uh, uh, here for uh, particular uh, metabolite peaks which are uh, changing after uh, ionizing radiation, which will turn on P53 and other uh, uh, tumor uh, suppressor and oncogene-related pathways. And what we see here is a substantial difference in this heat map for uh, the P53 knockout mice versus the P53 uh, wild-type mice. And uh, again, this highlights the, the, um, the striking differences between normal and malignant cells. So the question that we want to ask is, can we uh, uh, um, uh, uh, take advantage of these differences to start uh, uh, developing approaches where we can perhaps see some changes in easily accessible uh, biofluids rather than having to biopsy patients and possibly in the long term being used to monitor uh, for patients who are at risk. And so what we decided to do was to use a, a well-characterized uh, mouse model uh, uh, for a pancreatic adenocarcinoma uh, so uh, there's a, a particular oncogenic RAS, which is activated uh, when crossed into a Cree uh, background. And these mice uh, develop a sort of a predictable progression from, uh, uh, from uh, pre-malignant lesions to frank malignant, uh, frankly adenocarcinoma, uh, with some similarities to uh, human uh, pancreatic cancer. And so the uh, different uh, types of uh, pathologic changes are shown on this sl slide. Uh, so we have these intra-epithelial neoplasias, or PAN-II, uh, which then progress to uh, uh, frank PEAC, or a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And uh, the variety of uh, additional mutations occur as, these, uh, the, as, as, uh, as the tumor progresses. So the question that we wanted to ask was, uh, Leah wanted to ask, was what can we see uh, at the metabolite level, and this just highlights that uh, this uh, uh, approach when the animals have the activated transgene, uh, in, oncogene in them, is that we get these lower grade tumors at earlier uh, times, and then at later times, uh, uh, we can go all the way up to frank uh, adenocarcinoma. So we can compare mice with the transgene who have different diagnoses uh, when they're uh, uh, sacrificed, as well as look at the, uh, uh, the, the control animals where the transgene has not been activated. And uh, what we uh, see here is that we uh, focused uh, primarily on serum metabolite analysis. We also uh, carry out urine metabolite analysis, as well as uh, 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 assessing uh, uh, changes in the, in the tumor per se. And uh, if we look at this 
here, metabolite analysis, what we see here for the uh, control. I'm trying to use this mouse here to keep the chip advancing. But uh, what we see here is that the, um, uh, 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 the, on the left we have the, uh, uh, the control mice, on the right we have the mice that are starting to develop these early lesions. Uh, this is a heat map in red, the increasing ex uh, expression of metabolites, and you can see a clear uh, uh, difference uh, in, 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 with each column being an individual mouse. Uh, by the time we get to 13 to 16 months, you can see an even more uh, pronounced uh, difference. So just to sort of approve the principle, uh, Leah in my lab went on to identify uh, a few metabolites, and uh, what I'll show you is some results uh, here for uh, a particular metabolite, namely citrate, where she found a, uh, a, 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 a an increase uh, that was statistically uh, significant uh, for the adenocarcinoma, particularly at the later times, and we saw the progressive increase uh, with from wild type to these early intraepithelial lesions all the way through to adenocarcinoma. And uh, the interesting finding was that when Joe Lacante and uh, El uh, Anton Wellstein's lab went back and uh, uh, screened uh, for uh, a citrate synthase in the actual tumor, and the tumors also should have increased such, uh, citrate, uh, what he found in the staining here is by immunohistochemistry is we find staining with the tumor but not in the normal tissue. So, so we're able to work back and look at the uh, particular enzyme responsible for this, which is upregulated in the tissue. And so citrate is probably not the ideal metabolite, but it does uh, sort of show a proof of principle that we can work back from the small molecule back to the enzyme. Okay, uh, so the conclusions there is that uh, we were able to detect the, map, the metabolite in, in, in the circulation. Um, this is the first report of it in the serum. Um, there have been some studies in humans showing increased citrate synthase activity in human pancreatic cancer. So you can say, well, this makes it less original, but I think it also gives us confidence that this model has some relation to what one would uh, uh, expect to see in human cancer. So there's ongoing studies that are going on now to uh, assess additional metabolic changes, and uh, I guess that what I'd ask you to do is to stay tuned and also to correlate this with patient data sets. So in the last few remaining minutes, I just wanted to mention some work from Marina Chima, uh, Marina Chima in my laboratory, uh, who is, uh, has her own uh, shop, and she's co-director of our uh, core, and this is the American Cancer Society pilot project that she uh, 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 carried out. And this was a tissue and match uh, serum samples that were obtained from the DiviMed repository. This is a relatively limited number of samples, and the numbers are listed here in this slide. And what we have found is that in, is that the surgeons and the pathologists, and me being a pathologist, I guess I should take partial responsibility, is that when a, a tissue is excised, our highest uh, um, priority is not getting it into liquid nitrogen quickly. And part of the problem is, is that sample collection is critical. If the tumor sits, uh, for example, in the operating room suite for 5, 10, 15 minutes, it gets hypoxic, there's a variety of metabolic changes, and the metabolism is going to change substantially. And this is a, a, a real problem in metabolomics. Now, Indivimed, which is a company, has developed, and in collaboration with Georgetown, uh, a, a sort of a uh, very uh, customized, uh, rapid, uh, uh, rapid collection of, of tumor samples in rapid freezing. And that's really proven to be critical to get a reliable signal. And, um, uh, and, and we also use uh, non-negative matrix factorization and scree plots to try to group the, uh, uh, the, the different spectrum and metabolites that she uh, uh, found. And uh, uh, what she found is that, uh, and, and was that there was some, particularly with the uh, adenocarcinoma, a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, is that there was dysregulation of lipid and nucleotide metabolism-related pathways. And so she's comparing pancreatitis, the inflammatory disease, where sometimes they're surgical specimens, to patients with uh, these early neoplastic lesions, which are not particularly frequent in surgical pathology, but there are a few that uh, uh, can be identified. And then a pancre pancreatic uh, uh, adenocarcinoma, and then finally uh, colorectal adenocarcinoma uh, with unrelated cancer, which was used as a control group. And so she worked with the tissue and then ex expanded it to the serum. 
And uh, this is the flow chart that is uh, being used. It's sort of a typical flow chart. Uh, you can modify the columns as well as the solvents and the approach you use to assess for both uh, a wide variety of metabolites as well as for looking at uh, lipid metabolites. And so this is a sub area of, of metabolomics referred to as lipidomics. And uh, the take home message here in this heat map is that she uh, identified seven uh, scree uh, uh, sort of clustered groups. And when she uh, analyzed these, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, adenocarcinoma, which is C7 on the, uh, on the uh, left side of the uh, screen, uh, uh, shows uh, uh, distinguishable differences from these uh, early ductal uh, changes, uh, that is the IPMN, and that differed from pancreatitis. And then uh, the colorectal, uh, there were several screen, uh, screen groups that uh, uh, indicated some diversity in these tumors. And uh, uh, so this was a, sort of an encouraging uh, first step in this uh, uh, study. And what I'd like to do in the final minute or two is to say, well, how do we hope to, to, uh, 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 use this in the clinic? And uh, uh, Suba Madahabia was brought in from the NCI a few years ago and has put together a program referred to as the Georgetown Database of Cancer. Uh, when you're putting together these initiatives, it's important to have an import, uh, a nice uh, initial, so it's called GDOC. Uh, she provides t-shirts to everyone in Georgetown, so you'll see that if you come there, people wearing GDOC t-shirts. Um, and. Uh, Here it comes. And so uh, the, the way she's built this is that we have a, a large ca cancer catchment, which is the bottom of this uh, pyramid. Uh, the next is the clinical and uh, epidemiologic studies. And the idea here is to incorporate that with gene expression, DNA analysis, and, uh, uh, and as well as proteome and metabolome and kinome analyses. So all of these are uh, being incorporated into a master database and integrated. Uh, and so her job is the Georgetown Database of Cancer, uh, which is the orange block, and then that will go to prognosis, uh, biomarker, and drug development. And finally, the idea at the top is to have a systems medicine and clinical approach. So the doctor of the future will sit down with gigabytes of data and will use these types of tools to uh, inquire on the genome, the metabolome, the proteome, and uh, all the clinical parameters that are available and with uh, the, the cost of DNA sequencing and the like coming down, uh, those days are really uh, uh, fast approaching. So in this example uh, here, uh, I think I'm going to diverge a bit from pancreatic cancer and look at the uh, Indivity Med uh, 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 40 patient set that uh, we had for uh, colorectal cancer. And so here and, uh, is uh, what she did was carry out a uh, genome-wide profiling for 40 early uh, stage 1 and stage 2 colorectal cancer patients. And uh, so with the Indivimed, what we did is the samples were frozen and then they were assessed two years later and we looked at the uh, results and asked which of the patients failed, namely which of the patients developed a metastatic or recurrent disease compared to those who should have been cured uh, by the surgery alone since it was localized cancer. And so the idea then was to identify molecular signatures to serve as prognostic markers of recurrence and, and then to optimize this for uh, chemotherapy, uh, uh, presumably in the future. And so the key abnormalities were genes, gene expression, metabolites, DNA copy number, and the like. And um, what was interesting is when we did the analysis, we could distinguish the uh, people who were the winners versus the losers in two years. And the most pr frequent and predictive, in interestingly, were at the metabolomics level. And uh, I should also mention that uh, by a donation by the Roosh family, we have a Roosh Center for uh, GI cancer research, uh, which is part of the Lombardi Con uh, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center at Georgetown. And so this is the uh, matrix that uh, 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 Suba uh, and her team put together, and then Rita, uh, and uh, our, our team in, in, in the genomics, in the metabolomic score, carried out both urine and serum and metabolite analysis of the patients at the time of surgery. And so we had miRNA, a gene, copy number, uh, uh, transcriptomics and the like, and these different colored boxes refer to that. 
There's a variety of filtering approaches and then an analysis of top omic features of the relapse on, on, the, uh, on the left here versus uh, the, uh, 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 of the uh, various features which uh, can distinguish these two groups. So uh, this paper has been recently published in one of the genomic journals and I'll refer you there for uh, the specifics. Uh, but the take home message here is that there was 31 metabolites, oops, uh, don't seem to be able to use the pointer very well, uh, uh, that, that uh, was strongly associated with the uh, CRC relapse and, pay, and uh, the, uh, uh, these 31 uh, markers uh, pointed to uh, 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 pathways related to immune response, immune cell signaling, and trafficking as predictors of re uh, relapse risk. And if we look on the right, uh, this sort of a star-shaped uh, um, uh, system here, uh, 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 Suba has, uh, and Amrita have color-coded uh, the different markers, so the red are up-regulated metabolites, the brown are down-regulated metabolites. And as you can see here, and this is from uh, a serum in urine, not from the, from the tumor per se, although they did work back from the tumor as well, is what we can see here is that the majority of the, of the metabolites that uh, were, uh, gave a, a, a distinguishing separation uh, uh, between the uh, uh, relapse-free and the relapsed cases were in fact metabolites. Uh, there were others such as gene expression and copy number, but the number of particular markers was less. And then down at the bottom, uh, 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 Suba has used her system's uh, 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 magic to uh, put this together into uh, several different uh, pathways involved in inflammation and, and infection and the like. So uh, that is sort of the hope that we have is to be able to integrate all of these different omic approaches and to use this to make a smarter diagnosis about which patients have a, a, a tumor where the biology is, uh, is going to indicate uh, early metastatic spread even if we, uh, the surgeon doesn't and the pathologist don't see it and as well as uh, therapy in the future. Um, the most important slide here is the contributors, and this is the way Georgetown looked a few weeks ago. We still have some foliage uh, on the Potomac, and uh, Leah and Titus are in my lab, and then Anton's lab is nearby with Joe Lacante, uh, who's now actually a, a, a medical intern, and Amrita Chima and uh, her staff uh, were uh, all also uh, uh, key players in the metabolomics operation. And then the GTOC team, uh, led by Suba Havi, is a, a large uh, collection of talented individuals, which I've listed here. So uh, hopefully I've given you an overview of, uh, of uh, modern metabolomics and what you can do with it, and how uh, even with these uh, limited pilot projects uh, and using the mouse model as guide, uh, we, I think there's good promise then that both in serum and urine and, and uh, uh, probably other easily accessible biofluids or breath metabolomics, uh, we are uh, on our way to developing additional biomarkers that uh, will uh, hope help clinical care. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention, and uh, I, I guess I can take questions if you wish. Uh, there was one of the members, I think, of the Supreme Court, uh, a woman, 
uh, who actually had an MRI for unrelated reasons, and they picked up an early pancreatic cancer that was cured. So it is curable, as you know, and the idea here is to develop biomarkers that can uh, presumably detect it at an early age, and, or an early stage. And I think the, the, the beauty of metabolomics is that, yes, these machines are expensive and difficult to use, but once you identify a subset of metabolites, whether it be a few or, or a few dozen, that's really just clinical chemistry. And so that's something that could be done in a screening way as people, uh, if you want to assess patients at risk or even with age. And I think that uh, there's uh, one slide that I show uh, sometimes of a, uh, of a character from a TV show uh, called Star Trek. Mr. Spock had a tricorder that would record, uh, and, and you pass it over a person, and he can sort of record all of their biology. And I think that's sort of a, a focus of many of the NIH institutes, both NIHS and NCI and the like, to develop some of these biomarkers that can be assessed early on. Well, what's the answer to my question? Are we getting there, or what we are doing? Well, I think at this point we're in the process of characterizing the, the biomarkers, and I think the, there's promise, but as far as, uh, uh, as uh, commercialization, there has been some, as you know, for uh, uh, certain types of breast and lung cancer and the like. But I think that these will be coming in the next uh, five years, uh, and I think that the, the, uh, the, that I, I'm optimistic that these types of approaches, particularly as the costs come down, can be used for screening. Mr. Albert, thank you. Thank you for the, for the really interesting talk. Uh, do you, um, so I was really interested in seeing that you have, at least in the case of P53, some type of signature that appears to uh, to change dramatically the metabolomic profile. Uh, do you think that there is a, uh, some type of a parallel between different types of uh, tumor suppressors and how different types of tumor suppressors might induce different type of metabolomic, metabolomic signatures? Um, um, and, and you can imagine the same point for oncogenes, but I'm really interested in the tumor suppressor aspect. I think that the, the underlying molecular defects are going to af affect the metabolism. And I think that's part of the problem until recently. I've been on some of these metabolomic uh, study sessions, and the people who are absolutely superb at the chemistry don't know much about the biology. And I remember one person uh, giving a fantastic review to a gram with a few uh, non-isogenic lines where we had no idea of what pathways were perturbed, and they were all enthusiastic about that. So I think that this is an area that I think is, um, needs to be uh, characterized, and uh, I think the tools are there, and it can be done relatively quickly by whoever wants to, but I would uh, predict, based on just the simple things I showed with B53, that there will be a, 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 a big change. I'd also refer you to the NCI-60, there's a fair number of uh, omic studies in that cell set, including uh, metabolomics now, and uh, there's a variety of interesting features that have come out. Of course, these lines have hundreds of different mutations, but you can see some clear P53 signatures, for example. So I think maybe we have some time for uh, questions from here. Yeah. Okay. I see two hands. One there. So here's a scientific question. Uh, I always had a problem with these, you know, metabolomics type of approaches because they really left me asking the question whether we're really seeing the cause of the disease or the effect of the disease. And can we really find out cooperative effects? I, I think what people like Benjamin Kravat at Scripps are doing, looking at functional metabolomics, and I think one of his postdocs now at Harvard, the same. Do you think that's that should be a bigger priority, or what's your take on this? I think that from a biomarker standpoint, it doesn't matter. If the biomarker is there and you can use it for early diagnosis or to uh, make predictions on
clinical outcome, it doesn't matter. I think that what you say is, is correct. I think the only way to address these types of issues is a genetic approach at the current time. And for example, using a mouse model approach or a, you know, a knockdown approach in cell lines and the like, and knock out individual pathways and start uh, sorting this out. I think that um, the, one of the advantages of metabolomics, I thought you were going to criticize the fact that we don't know what many of the peaks are, but sometimes you'll find a peak uh, that's not in the, in the database. For example, Gary Paddy found a particular uh, spingerine, or excuse me, ceramide related uh, compound that he published in one of the nature, I think, chemical biology a year or two ago uh, that was involved in pain mediation in the spinal cord. And he found a particular peak which was not actually known at the time, and uh, then went back and you know, did the fragmentation analysis and eventually you know, like, uh, uncovered the particular metabolite. So I think that uh, not knowing what the peak is sometimes is an advantage uh, when you're doing uh, the, these survey type of experiments. This is really uh, pure untargeted metabolomics when you're using the QTOF approach. There are targeted metabolomics, which I think uh, or one of the other speakers at least will be speaking about. Okay, then I'll leave my second question. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank also the, the Center of Excellence for organizing this international conference. Uh, my question here, uh, as the doctor said, the pancreatic cancer is one of the worst diseases. It's bad disease, as, as we know. And most of the patients died uh, during the two years from the diagnosis. This is the problem. The problem of the detection of the disease. Uh, most of the patients. The disease was diagnosed at the late stage. So we have a problem with the detection. Do we go to the question? The question. The question is, uh, do you think, Doctor, uh, when we know this biomarkers, uh, if we target with some molecules or some, some, some uh, molecules or some compounds or some chemical molecules, if it's, it, it's a curative uh, way or it's a good strategy to uh, at least to prevent the disease, for example, we know that the metabolites are cellular metabolites. If we target these chains or these biomarkers, we can prevent disease. We can prevent the, the cures of disease in Tibet. Thank you. I think it could be used to identify patients or individuals that's at risk, and I think there is a lot of epidemiology. One thing I should mention is the cost of doing the high throughput LCMS, at least when you have your own shop, it's about 10 times cheaper than running, for example, the RNA arrays. So you can do a lot of samples. We've run up to 1,500 sample sets. I think that the point of showing the uh, pancreatic mouse model is that these intraductal uh, 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 dysplasias that did give uh, metabolomic signature both in the pancreas as well as in the serum these would be akin to an uh, easily resectable tumor in, in a patient. So the idea would be is not everyone can have yearly MRIs or MRIs over six months and CAT scans and the like, but uh, if we could identify subsets of people where uh, suspicious metabolites, which were screened uh, um, much more cheaply, then they could be uh, brought in uh, for hopefully early intervention. I think the question of, uh, of uh, at-risk populations and, and the like is, is, is complicated and uh, there's a tremendous amount of effort in, in the field already on that. And you'll hear about some of that uh, later today. I have a well, question. Uh, well, go ahead. Yes, yes. Fine question. Okay, thank you for this presentation. I have uh, actually two parts of my question. The first one, the, the sample preservation. We know that the, um, uh, the metabolism change very quick within the sample and it get, uh, get quickly hypoxic before getting get examined. Uh, the optimum time and, and, and how we can be sure that the, uh, the chemistry within the cell is not change uh, in the time processing until uh, we examine it. The second part is uh, the, um, the citrate synthesis, the citrate biosynthesis, it get affected. Um, actually, the start runtime A control it, 
just I want to know the uh, effect of the hormones, insulin and glucagon, and controlling the metabolism of lipids and carbohydrates in, in, this, in this process. Thank you. I did not get the second part, but the first part is about how to optimize getting the specimens from the OR. And this is as a surgeon, you know, we right. have that problem every day. The people in here, they want fresh specimens. The pathologist, he tells me, don't even touch the specimen, send it to me. And uh, there are logistic problems in here. People in the lab, they have to come with innovations, you know, how to keep the specimens fresh from time to you. This is the question. Well, we know that patients do very badly in four minutes with no oxygen. And I think that tissue does badly for four minutes with no oxygen. So, I, uh, my understanding of the indivity then is that the sample is excised and a portion of it is, goes into liquid nitrogen or onto dry ice almost immediately within the OR. And so I think that's one of the issues with looking at uh, metabolomics of, of, the, of the tissue. Uh, that was done in the, uh, uh, the uh, color, uh, that was done in the pancreatic study from Amrita Chima that I showed. But uh, she also then went on to validate some of those findings in serum. Now, serum and urine is a different story. Uh, there, the collection is easy. It's easy to spin out the serum. Whatever is in the serum is reasonably uh, stable, so you can spin out the serum and freeze it within uh, five or ten minutes. But I think that to isolate for the, um, uh, the patient, you really need to change the surgical procedure and as a pathologist who, when I remember when I was in training many years ago, as they were always very emphatic about looking at margins, I don't know how the pathologist and the surgical surgeons are going to feel about uh, a, fraction, a fraction of the tumor going into liquid nitrogen immediately. But that's basically what needs to be done. Thank you. Maybe uh, you can ask the question if you don't mind on the 